It was, of course, a very big day in the history of Fulton, Missouri, when President Truman and Winston Churchill paid their visit. About 30,000 people had invaded this small Middle Western town, and if we don't see many of them in the street, it's because they were crowding the campus of Westminster College. But what we might call the collection of another degree wasn't the big event this time. It was Churchill's speech, now awaited by about 3,000 people inside, 30,000 outside, and the rest of the world. It's a pity, but the cameraman's strong lights always worry Mr. Churchill on these occasions. President Truman introduces him. It's a pleasure to me to introduce Mr. Churchill. He's one of the great men of the age. He's a great English man. He's a great Englishman, but he's half American. <laughs> and it's one of the great privileges of my lifetime to be able to present to you that great world citizen, Winston Churchill. This is how Churchill began his address in Westminster College, Missouri. The, the name Westminster somehow uh, or other seems uh, familiar to me. <laughs> I, um, I feel as if I'd heard of it before. Uh, indeed, now that I come to think of it, it was at Westminster that I received a very large part of my education. Uh, in uh, politics, dialectic, rhetoric, uh, and one or two other things. <laughs> the, the president has told you that it is his wish, as I'm sure it is yours, that I should have full liberty to give my true and faithful counsel in these anxious and baffling times. The strong lights were making things difficult for him, and at this point it was necessary to dim them, which rather spoils the picture, I'm afraid. Neither the sure prevention of war nor the continuous rise of world organization will be gained without what I have called the fraternal association of the English-speaking people. <laughs> this means a special relationship between the British Commonwealth and Empire and the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, this is no time for generality, and I will venture to be precise. A shadow has fallen upon the scenes so lately lightened, lighted by the Allied victory. No, no, nobody knows what Soviet Russia and its communist international organization intends to do in the immediate future. From Stettin, in the Baltic, to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. I do not believe that Soviet Russia desires war. From what, what I have seen of our Russian friends and allies during the war, I am convinced that there is nothing they admire so much as strength, and there is nothing for which they have less respect than for weakness, especially military weakness. If we adhere faithfully to the Charter of the United Nations and walk forward in sedate and sober strength, seeking no one's land or treasure, seeking to lay no arbitrary control upon the thoughts of men, if all British moral and material forces and convictions are joined with your own in fraternal association the high roads of the future will be clear, not only for us, but for all, not only for our time, but for a century to come. Winston Churchill had spoken as a private citizen, but it goes without saying that his words carried the full authority of his unrivaled experience as Britain's great war leader. 
Let us hope they receive the very serious attention they deserve from all quarters. <laughs>